Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining in. And I wish you a very good day. And may peace be with you. We always say assalamu alaikum. That means may peace be with you. My name is Jamila Sathar, and I'm a hematologist and the current president of the Malaysian Society of Patient Blood Management, or my PBM. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you yeah, to our Masterclass 2 or on Perioperative Patient Blood Management Webinar Series Part 2. There are three parts to this series. Part 1, which took place in August, was on preoperative PBM, focusing mainly on anemia assessment and its management. For this present Part 2 webinar, we will be discussing about intraoperative patient blood management, keeping the blood in the patient. And part three, which will be on post-operative PBM is scheduled for early next year. We have three distinguished speakers, and we are very lucky, who have kindly agreed to take time off from their busy schedule to share their knowledge and experience with us. The first speaker is Dr. Pao Kyu Kong, a well-known cardiothoracic surgeon at the National Heart Institute, Kuala Lumpur. He has been practicing patient blood management for over 10 years now, maybe more, I think, and has performed complex heart surgeries in infants without any need for blood transfusion. He will review the survey questionnaire that the participants answered when they registered for this event. The second speaker is Dr. Lara Oller, who has graciously agreed on a very short notice to deliver the talk on anesthetic blood conserving strategies and optimizing cardiopulmonary function. Lara is a cardiac anesthesiologist at Maria Pia Hospital in Torino, Italy, where bloodless medicine and surgery is performed. She trained in Madrid, Spain, and also spent two months at Inglewood Hospital in New Jersey under the supervision of Dr. Arya Shander. She has special interest in oxygen transport physiology and hemorrhagic shock pathophysiology and is currently the primary investigator on a project called OxyLife, a novel intravenous fluid for resuscitation and as a blood sub substitute. And she has published a paper about, uh, on it. The third speaker is Dr. Nathaniel Usuro, Chief Consultant Surgeon at University of Calabar Teaching Hospital, Nigeria. Dr. Usoro is the founding chairman of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Group in University of Calabar, a multidisciplinary group of professional volunteers providing bloodless care for patients with excellent outcomes since 2007. Dr. Usoro is currently the president of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society in Africa. He is the recipient of several awards, including the 2016 SABAM Kathleen J. Sasama Award for the Outstanding Leadership in Advancing Patients' Rights in Patient Blood Management. Dr. Usoro will be speaking on meticulous hemostasis and surgical techniques. We will have the question and answer session and discussion at, at the end of all three talks. And I would also the knowledge like to introduce to you webinar. the panelists for our so webinar who have also graciously accepted the invitation because of their passion in patient blood management. Uh, first, and not first of all, I mean, first um, is Dr. Ananti Krishnamurti, my dear colleague and friend, who is also the secretary of my PBM. I would like to give her actually a virtual hug uh, for putting this webinar together. She is our pillar in my PBM. <laughs> And Sherry Ozawa, past president of SABEM, or the Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management. Dr. Angelina Gape, anesthesiologist from and, and uh, yeah, and the expert in patient blood management from Philippines. Dr. Katiresen Valiapa, cardiac anesthesiologist from Malaysia. Dr. Shunji Kawamoto, hepatobiliary surgeon from Japan. Hello. Dr. Jong Yeon. Lee, cardiac anesthesiologist from Korea, Dr. Innocent, Innocent Okowa, surgeon, anesthetist, obstetrics, obstetrics and gynecologist from Nigeria, Prof. Roland, Not, uh, Doma, Egba, 
He's our laparoscopic surgeon from Nigeria, Dr. Quinesh Kalu, anesthesiologist from Nigeria, Dr. Mandy Yap, hematologist from Ampang Hospital, Malaysia. And of course, the speakers will also be our panelists. Thank you very much from the bottom of, our, of my heart. And to all participants, I hope that you will put to practice the knowledge gained from this webinar. Well, thank you for your wonderful introduction, Jamila. It's such a great honor, a pleasure for me to be here and to be able to share uh, my short but exciting experience on bloodless cardiac anesthesia. Uh, this somehow has been my dream since I was a little girl and I continue to fight for it. So the title I've been given is uh, Blood Conserving Strategies from the viewpoint or the point of view of an anesthesiologist and optimizing cardiopulmonary function. Well, when I read the title of the talk, I thought that I could start speaking about the word optimizing, its meaning. Well, the definition is to make the best or most effective use of a situation or a resource. Of course, the question is, uh, what it is that I have to optimize and with what end? Well, I think we, all of us will agree that macrovascular resuscitation should have a positive impact at the cellular level, at the mitochondrial level, at the capillary level. All of us as physici physicians have been raised uh, with the idea that these two formula, one included in the other, govern the whole uh, process of oxygen transport in the body. You see dissolved oxygen, uh, sorry, oxygen delivery, uh, which is cardiac output multiplied by arterial oxygen carrying capacity. But the question is, does a single equation describe the whole concept? Well, if we look at how um, oxygen gets from the lungs to the tissues, we will see that something is missing in, this, in these two formulas. Of course, we have oxygen delivery, we have oxygen consumption, the ratio between the two, but we also have dissolved oxygen in blood plasma, which is essential, oxygen diffusion, hypoxic inducing factor, yes, uh, genetics play a role in um, hypoxia or anemia tolerance, red blood cell velocity, functional capillary density, which is the number of functional or open perfused capillaries, and last, viscosity, which is extreme, extremely important to maintain perfusion, the capillaries open. So this picture, again, illust illustrates very well what I was trying to convey. We see that the dynamics of the macrocirculation have nothing to do with the dynamics in the microcirculation. First of all, we see that hemoglobin is dramatically reduced in the microcirculation. Somehow all of us are anemic in the microcirculation, but this really works for us. Also, you see that some capillaries are opened, but just dissolved oxygen in, in plasma is going through. No red blood cells are transiting through those capillaries. And you will agree with me that if capillaries are closed, are collapsed, it doesn't matter how much hemoglobin um, our, um, arterial blood carries, it won't be delivered to tissues. So yes, I would say that something is missing in those formulas. Oxygen diffusion depends on um, PO2 gradient and diffusion distance. Here you see what happens with interstitial edema. And you also see a mathematical model that shows that in this clinical situation, this, the oxygen, oxygen at the cellular level is decrease, further decrease with um, hypoxic hypoxia rather than with anemia or anemic hypoxic or low flow or uh, yes, low flow um, or hypoxia due to low flow. So this again shows that the uh, oxygen diffusion and dissolved oxygen in plasma are essential for optimum oxygen delivery to tissues. This video, I think clearly demonstrates what I'm trying to explain. This is uh, the microcirculation of um, a bleeding patient. Hopefully you can see it clearly. Um, this is the microcirculation, as I said, of a bleeding patient whose hemoglobin dropped to 2.8 grams per deciliter after uh, fluid resuscitation with a cellular fluids. You see that 
capillaries are perfused, red blood cell velocity is fine. But of course, we are threatening the formula. We are threatening arterial oxygen carrying capacity. So that's why the doctor decides to transfuse this patient with uh, three bags of red blood cells. Now you have the same area, um, the same, um, yeah, the same area of the same patient after the transfusion of three bags of allogenic red blood cells. And you see that perfusion has been impaired. Red blood cell velocity is not, is not the same. So yes, we are fixing the formula, we are fixing the number, but are we really optimizing the microcirculation? Are we really optimizing how oxygen gets to the tissues? Well, I, I think you can give an answer to that. Um, and last but not least, we recently published, uh, along with Dr. Chandler and other collaborators, uh, we published that um, oxygen solubility, the coefficient of oxygen solubility in blood plasma, um, once thought to be a static number, is actually a dynamic number. And it modifies with hemodilution and also depending on the fluid used for resuscitation. Of course, now you may say, well, at the macrocirculatory level, it has a little impact, and I agree. But remember that um, uh, oxygen uptake um, happens in the microcirculation, and this new finding may have an impact in the microcirculation. So we claim that arterial oxygen formula, um, uh, yes, uh, should be modified, and also all elements that, that make possible oxygen delivery to tissues and cells uh, should include um, oxygen diffusion, dissolved oxygen in plasma, um, viscosity, uh, and FCD, as we already mentioned. Well, after this somehow a provocative um, introduction, let's see what can we do as anesthesiologists to keep the blood in the patient other than putting just the patient to sleep. Um, there are simple measures that we can apply that are very easy to apply and that may have a very, uh, a very positive impact on our patients. For example, the first one, positioning, proper uh, positioning properly our patient. You know that in the venous system, blood, blood pressure is determined by hydrostatic pressure and transmural pre pressure. This is far different from the arterial system, uh, which is regulated by other factors. So what can we do? For example, we can elevate the surgical field so um, the hydrostatic pressure will not be high. Also, for example, of paramount importance is to avoid uh, compressing the venous drainage of the surgical field. Uh, this is of paramount importance in surgeries such as liver resection. Something that can be done is to rotate the operating table to the left, so um, vena cava is, 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 is fine, is working well. It doesn't suffer any type of compression. Also, we can do a checking before wound closure. Closure. How to do so? Well, we can place the operating field under the level of the heart and see if there's any vessel still bleeding. Control hypertension. Well, this uh, regards the arterial system, as you know. Um, I want to explain or say something here. Uh, when we talk about control hypertension, we talk of a patient who is normovolemic. We are not talking of a patient that is hypovolemic and hypotensive because this can lead to a vasoconstriction, low cardiac output, um, and finally, ischemia. So uh, once said that, we can choose the degree of hypotension. And of course, the comorbidities of the patient will help us choose uh, the degree of hypotension. Uh, we as anesthesiologists, uh, we have so many ways to achieve that. We can uh, rely on um, gas, uh, propofol, um, opioids. The difference among propofol and uh, gas is that propofol reduces blood pressure by reducing cardiac output, while gas reduces uh, blood pressure by reducing or by generating um, arterial vasodilation. 
Of course, regional or epidural anesthesia are um, two sound options that I'm, I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with in my daily practice. But of course, in other type, type of surgeries, they can help to reduce uh, bleeding in the operating field. Also, we have vasodilator agents such as nitroglycerin, micardipine, and so on, also beta blockers that other than reducing her rate also generate vasodilation. When this, apply, this technique is applied, um, it, it's essential to uh, monitor uh, our patient properly. Of course, lactate, uh, any sign of acidosis, um, urine output, any modification in the electrocardiogram, a pulse oximeter, and if we can count our regional oxygen saturation in the brain, that would be something great too. Warming. Well, we know that temperature clearly affects enzymatic reactions in our, in our body. And of course, the clotting process is included there. Uh, with hypothermia, sorry, with hypothermia, there is platelet dysfunction and also um, fibrinolysis is increased. So we have to fight against that. We have to prevent this hypothermia by warming IV fluids, also the fluids used for wound irrigation. We can use blankets as soon as possible and apply an active rewarming uh, after sur surgery, upon the arrival of the patient in the ICU. Also, we can talk about fluid administration. This is an eternal and long debate. What, how much, and when? Uh, with regard to avoiding excessive blood loss uh, during surgery, I think two rules must guide our practice. Restricted fluid administration until hemostasis, uh, hemostasis sorry, is achieved. And when a major, major bleeding is controlled by the surgeon, normal bulimia must be established. And then the eternal question, what? There's a long, long debate, very long debate here. And normally debates become eternal when we are not asking the right question. question. I think that's the real problem in this area. Uh, keep in mind that body weight balance status is multifactorial. Position, vascular permeability, inflammation uh, play an important role with regard to body fluid balance. So I think that the key idea or the take home mes message should be that plasma volume expansion with intravenous fluid is, or intravenous fluid, sorry, an S is missing, is context sensitive. So given that we accept this reality before choosing the fluid for resuscitation, some questions uh, should be answered. For example, what is the underlying disease of the patient? Am I, treat, am I treating a septic patient or a bleeding patient? Because physiopathology is absolutely different. The fluid loss is absolute, is relative. What's the ratio among DO2 and VO2? Is there, is there any sign of tissue hypoxia? What is intravascular oncotic pressure? How is working the lymphatic system of the patient? Because for example, for albumin infusion, we, we know that albumin distributes the interstitium. So if the lymphatic system is not working well, um, uh, albumin will remain in the interstitium, increasing the oncotic pressure of the interstitium and generated, generating edema. So the lymphatic system has to work well in order to get this albumin from the interstitium interstitium and bring it back to the bloodstream. So this is another interesting question that normally is just um, forgotten. What is the oxidation status? How is the glycocalyx of my, my patient? The FCD, how are capillaries working? The coagulation status, renal status? And when we, we give the answer to all these questions, then we are in position, in the position to choose the proper fluid for sedation. Now let's talk specifically about a very, very common technique in cardiac uh, surgery or cardiac anesthesia, which is ANH, acute normovolemic hemodilution. Uh, as I said, it's really common during um, uh, cardiac anesthesia, but it also can be performed in other surgeries uh, with expected uh, bleeding, for example, liver resection again. What's the basic rational? 
acutely diluting the patient's blood helps in that fewer blood components are lost per milliliter of blood loss. Simple. How is it done? Well, after uh, anesthesia induction through a central venous catheter, blood is withdrawn and kept in those bags. These are citrated bags that are kept um, above these oscillators so the components can continually move because do not forget that we talk about whole blood. Then this blood is given back to the patient um, after uh, the cardiopulmonary bypass is finished and protamine um, in order to antagonize heparin is infused. The good thing about that is that we are given autologous platelets, autologous plasma, and we can help in optimizing the population status of the patient um, after cardiopulmonary pump. Contraindications, of course, nothing is perfect, and, but there are only relative contraindications. For example, severe um, coronary artery disease, poor renal function, endocarditis, and severe aortic stenosis. With regard to endocarditis, remember that we are talking about whole blood and leukocytes are still functional and have anti an, an antibacterial effect. Whether to do this technique, whether to apply this technique to a patient or not, and how many bags to withdraw um, is guided by uh, the application of this formula. We use this formula in my, my clinic, in my hospital, and we measure um, red cell volume by multiplying the hemoglobin of the patient um, per the ideal weight of the patient in kilograms. And you see, depending on the number we get, we withdraw one back, two backs, three backs, or none. Another word of caution here is that hemoglobin is a concentration. And sometimes hemoglo hemoglobin is not a good indicator of the red cell mass. So especially with patients that are under diuretics, um, we have to be cautious and not take too much blood or not withdraw too much blood of the patient. So again, we have to put this technique in the proper clinical um, setting and choose wisely. Here the video, you see what we do um, uh, in, the, in the operating room of my, of my hospital. Another, another important technique in order to uh, avoid excessive or recoup um, blood that has been lost by the surgeon this is cell salvage. Again, the basic rationale is to collect, wash, and concentrate blood shed in the wound during and after surgery. It's indicated if the estimated blood loss during surgery amounts to one liter. And of course, there are different techniques. Um, it depends a lot on the country and the infrastructure of the, of the center we work in. And Another um, something or something else to keep in mind is, is that cell salvage can be performed with or without washing blood. And it can be, it can be applied uh, intraoperatively and also postoperatively. Here you have uh, this diagram and also the quote of or the station of this article, which I think really explains very well how cell salvage uh, works and, and the implications for a clinician, for an anesthesiologist in this case. Um, you see that um, in this diagram, um, a dual lumen catheter should be used. In one line, the red blood cells or blood is coming from the wound, and in the other line is heparin um, coming in. So all the, in those, to get, in those um, or these two together go to the reservoir. And from this reservoir, we bring this blood to the cell saver. Uh, through centrifugation, um, uh, every element of blood is separated. Red blood cells are washed. And then these red blood cells with a final hemat hematocrit about um, ranging from 50 to 80% are infused back to, to the patient. Of course, given, given that we are getting rid of um, plasma and platelets, thrombocytopenia and the dilution of clotting factors 
may occur. So this is something, again, to keep in mind, especially if we are using um, or we are doing a lot of cell salvage. Here we talk a little about direct cell salvage, meaning the reinfusion of blood that has not, not been washed by a cell saver machine. The problem here is that this blood has been in contact with the wound. So we have the fibrinized blood that is not actually able to clot. Also, we have blood with a very low hematocrit, nothing to do with the hematocrit that we get after uh, washing the blood. There's complement activation and also there's free hemoglobin. hemoglobin that it can be risky uh, for the kidney and also can um, scavenge nitric oxide, thus impairing um, capillary perfusion. While, as I said before, with indirect uh, cell salvage, meaning we are washing the blood, uh, we get rid of free hemoglobin, potassium proteins, we get a high hematocrit, leukocytes elimination uh, is high, um, red blood cells membrane is stable and also the levels of 2,3 DPG are within normal, which is great because we are getting blood that is able to deliver oxygen to the tissues. If we are concerned about direct cell salvage, we can use this, we can do this. This is a video of something we perform in our hospital. You see that blood that it is within uh, the drains, the drain of or the reservoir of this patient. We are bringing this blood to the cell saver machine. We are washing it, and then we are reinfusing this to the patient. So this is something that can be done in order to avoid the possible complications of reinfusing. Um, unwashed um, blood to the patient. And this, this is another eternal uh, debate. Um, some concerns have been raised with regard to if the field is contaminated by bacteria, if the field is contaminated by tumor cells, and if it's contaminated by amniotic fluid, well, keep in mind that the only absolute content contraindication for cell salvage is patient refusal. That's a key idea that we have to keep in mind. And to reason a little bit, with, with regard to bacterial contamination, um, a second suction device can be used. Also, leukocyte depletion or depletion filters uh, can further reduce the amount of bacteria infused. But keep in mind that cell washing significantly reduces uh, bacterial uh, contamination, also the number of cancers of, of tumor cells, and also the constituents of amniotic fluid. But I also like to put things in, in, in perspective, because what it is in the other end of the scale, there is blood transfusion, right? Blood transfusion has demonstrated to um, increase um, cancer relapse and also uh, bacterial infection. So are we, should we really discard a therapy that has a theoretical risk for bacterial contamination or um, tumor cells dissemination for, and, and to use a therapy with a proven, proven risk for uh, bacterial infection and cancer relapse? Well, again, I think I think that um, the question has to be, or the answer to this question uh, has to be yours. And after the surgeon has done its job, we as anesthesiologists uh, have to do our job, right? So as I said, um, uh, in my case, uh, um, I, I speak in the context of uh, cardiac surgery, and this is part of the protocol uh, that we apply or that we use in our center. Of, of course, tranexamic acid is um, const constantly used um, um, after anesthesia induction and also after uh, protamine. Uh, reinfusion of whole blood units um, that have been withdrawn in order to perform A and H 
are also given back to the patient um, after protamine, after cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, one gram um, of calcium gluconate uh, should be given for every uh, back, um, uh, given back to the patient due to uh, citrate uh, or citrate presence. Um, we use fibrinogen, we use uh, PCC, we use um, desmopressin, especially if patients have been under treatment with cardio aspirin or if the cardiopulmonary pump has been very, very long, the time of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. So this is a clinical case, a real life experience that we had a long, not long ago, a month ago. It is the case of an aortic uh, dissection tape RA that we repaired in our center. Um, the patient, um, you see, um, uh, her story, sorry, I, I have to move this, yes, here, okay. She is a 65 uh, years old female uh, with comor the comorbidities that you can see here. And as I told you, she was diagnosed with aortic dissection type A. Uh, it involved all aort aortic arc, but the aor aortic valve, uh, valve sorry, was preserved. Her problem, she was a Jehovah's Witness patient and she suffered a lot of, of pressure by physicians in order to accept blood transfusion. She refused and finally she was transferred to our center in a helicopter for a surgery. This is the team that actually treated uh, this patient. And I also wanna highlight this sentence, bloodless medicine is teamwork. Um, an anesthesiologist, a surgeon, a perfusionist alone doesn't, doesn't do anything. We need the collaboration of every single uh, person making up the team. Um, the patient, uh, as I told you, arrived in helicopter. She was already intubated. Uh, Glasgow before intubation was, uh, was fine. Only weakness in the um, left arm was noted. She arrived hemodynamically stable with esmolol in continuous infusion and her hemoglo hemoglobin at arrival was 11 grams per deciliter. So given that she, um, given her weight and also her um, hemoglobin upon arrival, no NIH uh, was performed. That was our clinical decision, but maybe other centers will ma would manage the situation otherwise. Tranexamic acid was given, antibiotics um, uh, during uh, surgery, arterial line was positioned in the right femoral, femoral artery and the venous line in the right atrium. Uh, hypothermia was applied. We reached 25 degrees um, during circulation arrest that only lasted 12 minutes. So this is, this is a clear demonstration of the amazing work that the surgeon did. So again, bloodless medicine is about teamwork. Um, after cardiopulmonary bypass, um, surgical hemostasis was performed. We reached normal thermia. And of course, until surgical hemostasis was achieved, hypotension was applied, having a systolic blood pressure ranging from 70 to 80 in order to avoid excessive blood loss. After surgical control of bleeding, uh, blood collected with the cell saver was given to the patient and noradrenaline infusion um, at a low rate was given to the patient for a systolic blood pressure ranging about um, 100. There was bleeding due to coagulopathy and a human complex was given, fibrinogen, desmopressin, and tranexamic acid. And finally, uh, hemostasis was achieved. Surgical drains were placed in the metastinic and retrosternal position, and chest closure was performed. And the patient finally was transferred to the ICU, hemodynamically stable, and with um, <clears throat> noradrenaline at a low uh, dosage. Upon arrival in the ICU, uh, the, her hemoglobin was nine grams per deciliter with no transfusion, transfusion of allogenic blood products. Her lactate was 1.5. Uh, 
no bleeding, there was no bleeding through surgical drains. Um, she was continued sedated and ventilated for 24 hours. Of course, uh, warming was initiated and the therapy for um, stimulating her bone marrow was also initiated. Pediatric tubes were used and re restricted uh, blood tests were applied and the uh, reticulocyte count uh, was also assessed in order to monitor uh, her response <clears throat> um, to anemia. The day after she was extubated, um, we were very happy to see that there was no uh, neurological deficit. I'm sorry it, for this um, mistake. Uh, neuroadrenaline uh, was uh, discontinued and her lab tests uh, were uh, within normal range. So this is something, this is a picture uh, with the patient. She was worried not to look uh, very pretty, but anyway, um, I'm also in the workplace. so. Uh, both of us are look like a disaster, but we are absolutely happy to see that bloodless medicine can be applied in any any situation, even in emergency. Uh, she was, as to continue with the story, she was discharged from the ICU in the, after three days of stay. Her lowest hemoglobin in the world was 6.5 grams per deciliter, a new dose of uh, EPO was given, but there were no signs of dysoxia during her recovery. Her current hemoglobin is 8.5 and she's about to be discharged home. Uh, something I wanna, I wanna say here is that she suffered a lot of pressure by physicians from the other hospital that told her that it was impossible to perform the surgery without using allogenic blood products. Actually, when she woke up um, the day after in the ICU, her first question was, uh, did you transfuse me? And while she was recovered in the, war, in the ward, um, she suffered a panic attack due to the pressure that she suffered in, in the other hospital. So. I think that physicians, we also have to be aware of the effect that our, wor our words or the pressure that we make on patients um, have upon them in, 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 a, in a long term. I think this is something that should make us reflect. And the lessons learned or the take home message or messages are that Bloodless PBM or bloodless medicine, whenever possible, is a multimodal approach. Not all con blood conserving strategies are applicable to all patients and to all clinical conditions. Bloodless medicine is safe and possible in all clinical scenarios, even in emergency, as you already saw. And bloodless medicine is teamwork. And with that, I thank you for your time. <laughs>